Welcome to the Fall Play YouTube channel. Good morning or good afternoon or even good evening to our fellow listeners. Um, welcome to our podcast for today uh, entitled Coffee with Foul Play. And believe it or not, uh, the title of our podcast today is Let's Follow the Evidence. And we're on part five at the moment. And all of us at Foul Play would like to welcome all our listeners and our subscribers. And well, we've made it to 447 subscribers, um, which is a fantastic effort considering we've only been in existence for a short while. And together, uh, we have had our videos have had over 45,000 views. Uh, our panel today would love to thank every one of you guys um, for coming on to the podcast and we hope that you have found them informative. Uh, a big shout out uh, to Mill Billy and his fantastic work that he does on his YouTube channel regarding the phone calls. And I urge everybody, if you haven't done so, please uh, visit Mill Billy's YouTube channel. There's some fantastic work, especially the current work that he's doing about the phone calls involving the law enforcement officers. Just a couple of announcements, guys. Uh, we've heard about the uh, filing um, by the state. It's now been delayed by a further 90 days. So it looks like we all got to wait, but I'm sure the wait will be worth it. Um, hopefully it'll be positive for Kathleen Zona and her experts and that we can see justice finally being done for both Stephen, Brendan and, of course, Teresa. Uh, it is with sadness um, that I have to say, and all of us on the Foul Play team, that um, some time ago, um, a moderator on Eric Cozy's channel um, had passed away, and her name was Ziggy. Um, our heartfelt um, condolences go out to uh, Ziggy's family. And um, yeah, it really is indeed a very sad occasion. Okay, guys. Well, joining me on the Foul Play channel this morning uh, are BB, Big Jeff, Kelly85, Christy, Milbilly, Zoe, and on chat, monitoring the chat, uh, is both Lily and Sammy. And guys, a big warm welcome to our guest researcher today, and his name is Kaboom Blam Zoom, <laughs> which is an incredibly funny name, but nonetheless, Nailed it. <laughs> it's not easy. I'll be referring to him as Boom, uh, just to shorten it. And uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to our podcast. Um, let's follow the evidence, part five. So, guys, if we start on slide 137. What we're doing in our podcast series, guys, is that we're following the chronology of uh, MAM-1. We're seeing how the case unfolded. Um, and what you note here on slide 137, I'll read it out for the listeners. And it states, in a pre-trial hearing about third-party liability, Judge Willis rules that the defence cannot offer any alternative suspects to the jury by name except Brendan. You can see on the slide here both Wigert, Kratz and Fassbender in deep conversation and thought. Now, when you think about this, this was a master stroke. It basically meant that both um, the attorneys representing Stephen were not allowed to point the finger at any other suspect during the trial. So this was a very, very clever move. And it meant that only Brendan could be called up in the trial. But what we note was that Kratz did not call up Brendan uh, to testify during Stephen's trial. So guys, I'll open it up to the panel. What effect do you think this particular restraint had on the defence? Um, who would like to make a comment? A big Jeff. 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Silkman. Uh, before, before I make my comment, I, I would uh, like to take the time to thank uh, Kaboom Blam Zoom uh, for his uh, FOIA yes. of the Stephen uh, jail phone calls. And uh, you know, if it wasn't for this person, this one researcher, uh, you know, t uh, tenaciously uh, asking and probably re-asking multiple times for things, we, we wouldn't have those to listen to. We'd have less clarity than we do right now. So thank you very much for that. Um, uh, kaboom, kaboom, that's an awesome, awesome effort. Uh, kaboom, would you like to make a comment about those phone calls quickly? There was no denial. I haven't been denied anything that I've requested uh, yes. ever. Um, yes. I, I actually pr appreciate Big Jeff and Zoe's contribution and yes. actually getting them to work. Uh, so. <laughs> on the way though yes thank you very much kaboom uh your your effort to do to get those phone calls have been fantastic for the research community everywhere yes big jeff yeah well so with regard to the 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 limitations that that put on the defense i mean just to uh for, for the for the listeners who might not be familiar with the trial lingo, not that I'm a lawyer, but uh, what we're talking about is the naming of Denny suspects. Um, yes. And uh, the, uh, there's, there's quite a, uh, a to-do that Kathleen Zellner makes in her recent filing uh, with regard to Stephen being denied uh, a fair trial because he was unable to name specific uh, Denny suspects. Yes. Uh, and it was quite interesting um, to hear, uh, to, 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 to know that Stephen actually made a list of potential suspects that included, uh, you know, his own, his own brothers, uh, yes. uh Bo Bobby and whatnot. Uh, and, uh, Judge Willis come back and say, um, well, these people don't have a motive. And <laughs> Stephen said, well, yes. I don't have one either. Uh, but of yeah, course, it's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Tremendously handcuffs the defense he keeps to say that, you know, it does. Uh, you know, you know, uh, Bob, Bobby could have been the last one to see her. You don't know that I was the last one to see her. So he cannot name that uh, a specific person. You can yes. he could say, well, someone could have pulled up to the side of the road and shot her. But he can't he can't say. Bobby did this, or he can't say Correct. Ryan did this. So that, yep. That's, that's a tremendous word. handicap. But it is, it is very much so a, a very big handicap. Uh, BB, do you have a comment? It also saved them a ton of work, the investigators, because by them doing that, they didn't have to investigate all the people that were at the yard that day. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, it really was uh, putting a, a muzzle basically on the defense. And what is interesting, uh, BB and Big Jeff, was that, oh, Kaboom, do you have a comment? I just want to say that the defense couldn't even point the finger at a unknown suspect. Yes. So they couldn't have said, oh, somebody shot her off the side of the road. They couldn't say that. It had to be Brendan or nobody. That is correct. Correct. And only Brendan they could actually name uh, in court. And of course, the um, state uh, did not call up Brendan to testify uh, against his own uncle. Uh, Kelly, do you have a comment? I just, I read somewhere that it was due to Stephen making a mistake in his paperwork and it had came down to a cross. Is that true? Or was it the fact that Judge Willis I... himself just decided to rule that there was be no Denny suspect. Yeah, I heard that as well. Uh, BB, do you have any comments about that? Have you read anything about that? No, but I bet it came from Kratz, boy. It sounds like a Kratzy move, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, you got to realise, guys, that um, before the trial actually even began, there was a lot of uh, wheeling and dealing going on. And uh, clearly, this was one of them uh, in which uh, both Dean Strang and Jerome Buting were not allowed to point the finger at anybody else. Now, what is interesting is that in a post-trial uh, interview where the judge was talking to both the um, defence attorneys, they actually did mention a whole list of Denny suspects, and, and they uh, voiced their frustration that during the trial they were not permitted to name these Denny suspects. And of course, guess who they were, right? Bobby Dassey, Scott Tadich, Ryan Hillegas, 
and I think there was one or two others. So oh, it must eight. have been, yeah, eight in total. Uh, Chuck and Earl. Uh, yes, yes. So it was very frustrating for the defence. And in actual fact, was a very, very clever move. Now, I don't know whether it originated from Judge Willis himself or in part it had to do with Stephen, bad preparation. But yes, you're right, guys. This is what uh, Kathleen Zona has used as part of her filing. And, you know, in all irony, think about it. You've got two, no, maybe three um, very strong Denny suspects in uh, both Bobby Dassey, Scott Tadich, and Ryan Hilligers, who were all on the stand. So it's pretty remarkable that the defence had to be very, very careful in the way they questioned that weren't permitted to point the finger at any anyone else apart from Brendan. Um, guys, do we have any other comments in regards to that? Okay. Uh, yeah, I have, uh, BB, I have a quick BB. one. Uh, yes. It might have also possibly been to cover the fact that law enforcement had strictly tunnel vision and didn't investigate any of the people, too. Might yeah. Have played a part in that decision. Yeah. Yes, it did. Uh, and that's an excellent point. In an actual fact, this is what allowed the tunnel vision to be created in the first place. So if you cannot point the finger at anybody else, then during the trial, you'll see. Um, BB, do you have a comment? You just said uh, the tunnel vision started before that because it, the yes. police yeah, had it. So, Correct, correct. And we'll be discussing that in today's podcast. But it meant that they could justify their tunnel vision because they weren't looking at anybody else bar Stephen. So the whole investigation was skewed very heavily towards one particular individual in this case, it was the individual that had a lawsuit that just happened to have a civil lawsuit against the county. All right, so that's a very, very clever move. Also a very crippling move to the defense. It would have been very, very frustrating. Okay, guys, do we have any other comments or can we go on to our next slide? All right, so guys, this to me was a very, if we have a look at slide 138, uh, this indeed was a very, very bizarre moment in the trial. And it, re and it was in regards to the phone calls. And what we have here is that several people uh, during the trial uh, were, in, were um, they were questioned about the phone calls that were all messages that were present on Teresa Horbach's phone. And it all involved about the messages. Now, a lot of experts were called in that had a look at the phone records that were present on Teresa's phone. And one thing became apparent pretty quickly, and that was there was no phone activity recorded after 2.41 p.m. So, Big Jeff, if you read that, what would that imply to you? No phone activity after 2.41 p.m. Big Jeff, do you have a comment on that? Uh, yeah, when, when you say uh, recorded, what you mean there is that um, she did not um, uh, answer the phone after that, <clears throat> after that time. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, it wasn't any evidence of her, you know, interacting uh, with her phone. Yes, yes, uh, yeah. The so, yeah. Yes. So, so yeah. The, um, and you know, the the, the two forty one p.m. Call, phone call is very interesting. Uh, you know, they they've it's it's the very famous call forward and not answer phone. I'm sure we'll, we'll probably have time to get to, get into that a little bit later. Yes. Um, but 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 my my comment would be that uh, in in a GSM cellular system, which is what Teresa had. Yes. Um, she uh, what what they did not do was produce any texts. There is a piece of a GSM cellular su network called a, a, a short message service center. It's a big yes. piece of their infrastructure. Texting was a billion dollar industry in two thousand and five. Yeah, it was uh, huge. <laughs> and uh, was they did huge. not. And, and if if her phone really went off the network at uh, two forty one, then yes. they should have been able to go to the SMS center, the SMSC, as some people will call it. 
And there should have been a backlog of these texts built built up. It was Halloween. She was going to a party. Yes. She yes. was 25 years old. She was getting texts. Uh, what was yeah. the last text that she answered? There, there, there was other means to check what her uh, possible activity was on, on that day. And, and they they did none of it. And it's a it's a sh shameful investigation of the cellular forensics by the state and yes. by the defense. Yeah, no question about that. Uh, Kelly, do you have a, a comment? I just got to wonder about that text that Jeff was talking about. Did they ever actually not not pull it? They hide everything else. Did they maybe pull it and they've looked at it and then it doesn't work in their favour? That's why they've hidden it for so long. Let's face it, they've hidden other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, well, is it? Yes. They might have pulled it. No one really knows. Yeah. There's so much uh, well, corruption. Well, what I can and... tell you. Yes, big yeah, I I, I, you, I agree. I agree with that sentiment. And, and we should, you know, we should keep on harping on that. Um, but let me tell you something about this. The, the cellular network companies are very concerned about um, uh, about people's privacy. If they, if they you know, they, yes. they were especially in that time frame, the FBI was uh, sort of ramping up, uh, you know, since the early 2000s time frame with the advent of cellular. This is a way to track people. This is a way to spy on people. Uh, you know, mobsters, the people like, oh, if this is going to be uh, a, yes. a thing that, that can invade my privacy, no thanks. So the cellular companies are really pushing back. Uh, on yep. law enforcement, and and when when the FBI goes and and you know, taps into your phone or or yeah. uh, gets your text, that, that, that's that's thing. a that's a, it's an invasion of privacy, and and the yes, phone companies is. do not do it willingly. Okay, no. Well, they 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 their assistance is compelled by subpoena, right? And those Correct. those subpoenas right have to yes. be very specific about the information that we're looking for. Okay. Yes. So if her texts were pulled, there would be a subpoena for it. And the subpoena would say yes. the text messages. So that, that would be a piece of documentation that exists not only in the records, but uh, yes. in the records of the of the of the state, but also in the records of Singular Wireless, who was bought by AT and T. So they they would have they might not have it anymore because it's been so long, but they would have had it then. So yes, that would be a way and to big, verify whether or not that was pulled. And Big Jeff, <laughs> have you seen any of that evidence at all? <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't, and I, yeah. I, I've, and, I've looked yeah, all and, over. Yes, and I'd just like to echo uh, with what Big Jeff and Kelly said. Uh, in Australia, we have very, very strong uh, protective laws in regarding to um, listening in to other people's conversations or getting um, access to people's texts. Uh, it's illegal, and potentially you could end up in jail and prison for doing so. But in this particular case, in the Theresa Horbach case, um, it, uh, the privacy issue seemed to have flown out the window because it's pretty clear here, if we have a look at slide 138, it looks like everybody under the sun was gaining access to Theresa's private um, message service and listening in. And the remarkable thing is when they were speaking to the brother, Mike Holbach, he actually admitted to listening to the messages on Teresa's um, mobile phone. And he was asked a direct question. Did you listen to the messages? Yes. I believe there were 18 messages in total that he listened to. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe that Mike Horbach disclosed the content of any of those messages. And it's rather remarkable. Yes, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? Yeah, no, just that you're correct. He did not disclose the content in any of them. Yeah. Uh, Bibi, do you have a comment? Well, to us, to the general public, he didn't. He might have with law enforcement or Kratz or, yes, you know. Yes, but the, the content of those calls were not uh, disclosed uh, during the trial. And when you're trying to work out, okay, where did Teresa go? Who did she talk to? But furthermore, who called her and what messages were being left? We don't know. Bibi, do you have a comment? When, you would think when Beauty and Strange had him on the uh, stand that when they got to cross-examine him or whatever, that they would have asked and dug into that. Uh, Bibi, I would have uh, wanted uh, to know. Yeah. I yeah. wonder whether they were prohibited from that, asking. Yeah, maybe, right? 
because yeah, they would have said, well, we've got privacy acts, et cetera, et cetera. It's something that probably should have been taking place behind closed doors, but we do not know. But what right. is clear is that Mike Hallbach definitely went into her phone records and listened to the messages. I believe there were 18 messages in total. And the important point, he was asked, did you erase any of the messages? And he said, no, he did not erase any of the messages. So that's interesting because what happens is when you've got a, a mailbox, uh, if people ring you all the time, if your mailbox is full, uh, Big Jeff, would you like to make a comment? What will happen if your mailbox is full? Big Jeff. Uh, you, you'll, you'll get notified that the mailbox is full and you'll get turned away from the voicemail. Okay. So quite clearly, if you ring up somebody and you get the notification, look, my, the, um, the message bank is full. If you ring back in a day or so and all of a sudden you can leave a message, what does that imply took place, Big Jeff? Uh, one one of two things: either a miracle happened and her voicemail capacity was increased, <laughs> which, yes. which we know didn't happen, <laughs> yes. or somebody deleted what, some of those messages. Right? Yes. Uh, Mill Billy, do you have a comment? Aliens. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I like to laugh, but unfortunately, I can't because aliens have been used actually in in the court of in in the trial itself to explain the key so yeah you could be right um but all jokes aside guys yeah quite clearly if you ring somebody uh, and you can now leave a message after previously you're getting a message full it means that someone has gone in and deleted messages and it's interesting that uh, during the trial uh buting stated I'll, I'll quote then at least one or more messages had to have been removed. So someone had tapped into her messages and actually had deleted messages from her phone. Now, this is rather remarkable that anyone would do this. And what is interesting is that um, Tom Pierce, uh, he was a, a question during the trial, and he stated that Teresa Horbach had received um, what he said were many harassing phone calls. So someone was calling her all the time, and I don't know whether they were leaving threatening messages or whatever, but Teresa said to Tom, look, don't worry about it. I could deal with this myself. Um, tell me, guys, on the panel, did law enforcement actually find out who this person was that was harassing Teresa? Who would like to make a comment? Um, Mill Billy. I, I, I think they had no reason to look anywhere else because they had their eye on their prize. Yeah, that's correct. But uh, Big Jeff. A comment. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with uh, with Mill Billy that uh, there was there was no uh, investigation, which is essentially the answer to your question, which is no, yeah. they did not uh, come up with an answer as to who it was. And a matter of fact, there's been very there's been a lot of researchers uh, who I've collaborated with uh, over the past year or so who who've, who've really tried to get to the bottom of who that might have been. Uh, yeah. And our, everyone's best guess is Ryan because of the frequency of calls between Teresa and Ryan and the email that said she was sick of them and the Green Bay stalking and everything else. But we don't we yeah. just don't know for sure. I mean, what, what does somebody yeah. consider annoying? What a call once every two weeks, a call every day? What you know? Okay. Yeah, but yeah. But if you, in the phone records, Teresa Halbach is calling Ryan Hilligus more than Ryan is calling her. Yeah. Uh, I just have a couple of comments. Um, oh, kaboom, kaboom. In regards to the stalker, I think it's, there's the potential it could be that Bradley Check as well. Um, he talks about how he texts her. And since we don't have those records, I think that could play into this. Yes. Um, I do have a question, though, for Big Jeff. When Mike called in to Teresa's voicemail, 
I'm assuming he has to have a special number to do so. <laughs> so like, well, he, 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 he might have been able to do it through, through the internet too. Okay. Yeah. Uh, normally, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Big Jeff, uh, normally when you get into uh, uh, messages, you've got to have a username and a password. And I remember that companies were very, very strict uh, in, in terms of if even if a family member phoned up a company and said, oh, look, I, I need to get into my son's messages or my daughter's messages, um, can you please disclose the password? They won't. And I believe even the FBI had trouble uh, getting into a, an iPhone. They wanted to get the password and Apple refused to disclose that password because of confidentially, you know, the confidential uh, uh, agreement that all companies have. Uh, Big Jeff, do you want to make a comment about that? Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely correct uh, about about that. Um, and uh, just to, I, I apologize, Kaboom, I don't think I let you answer your question, uh, ask your question fully. Um, but the uh, there, there were multiple ways to get into that voicemail account. One of them, as you suggest, would be dialing a special number. And when you hit the when you hit the voicemail button on your cell phone, it dials a number, and that number is unique to Teresa. Um, yes. And uh, and 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 that is, the, and then you have to answer it. Um, then you have to enter the password at that. So, so if indeed Ryan did dial that number, and he knew it, which which and it was knowable from his own yes. cell phone, then then he would have been able to access her records by that. Um, Sorry, I I'm believe not talking, that I'm singular not also. Kaboom! I'm not, oh, okay. I'm not talking about Ryan. I'm actually talking about Mike. Mike said he called in to yes, he did. listen to the. He did. So either he has her phone and touching the button or he's got the number to yes, dial so from that number is well, no well, he says in trial that he called her phone went to the voicemail options and he guessed her password <laughs> yeah yeah and um he was not um, Mike Corbach was not the only person to listen to personal messages uh we have the ex-boyfriend uh, Ryan Hilligers, who um, I think was Scott Blowdorn and some of Teresa's friends, now also got into her uh, phone records. Um, and apparently he was asked during the trial, well, how did you get in there? And he, I believe, made up a username and he guessed the password. Uh, Big well, Jeff. Uh, sorry, Mill Billy, do you have a comment about that? Well, what I think happened when Ryan did that, it may have been the first time anybody accessed the internet for that phone on the its web page. So he may have been setting it up for the first time. Okay. And he already has all of her information. He's on her computer. Yes, he is. He is. Um, a big Jeff. Do you have a comment? Well, I, I totally concur with that. It's very likely that he had that he had done that. Although. I strongly suspect that this, that that this was that that he did it for the first time, but the first time was not November third. Uh, I strongly suspect that yeah. he was stalking her. He he's the one who set up the electronic account, but uh, yeah, because <laughs> they they would probably be able to say when that account that internet access first happened. But I, I think he was using it to stalk her, is my opinion. Yep, yeah. and uh, of course you see, uh, we all know that there was not. A proper victimology study being done on Teresa Horbach. Basically, who was Teresa seeing? Uh, what what were her associates? And the key critical question: this two was Ryan Hilligus, who's an ex boyfriend of Teresa, was he listening into her phone messages? How long was he doing this? And who was the person who was harassing Teresa Horbach? on her mobile phone all the time. So it'll be very interesting. Unfortunately, law enforcement did not do a proper investigation. And to this day, we still do not, we still do not know who was making those harassing phone calls. And to me, if someone goes missing, that would be the obvious thing to try out. Bibi, do you have a comment? Um, just that Zoe's unable to speak. Um... 
but yes. she said that Ryan said the username just came up when he entered in the phone number and he guessed the password and then it's uh, her sister's birthday. Yep. Yes. So um, he had the ability to listen to those calls. Furthermore, he probably also had the ability to erase calls as well. Big Jeff, do you have a comment? I, I do, and I apologize for interrupting your uh, train of thought no, there. That, that is absolutely all. correct. Um, you know, uh, t t take take a listen to our last Thursday's uh, Thirsty for, th for Theory. Uh, yes. And listen to the theory tree. That, I mean, what, because what I wanted to throw out was that it's the same person, uh, Tom Pierce, who tells us about the harassing phone calls. That also tells us that uh, that Teresa told him that this was uh, her last day ever working for Auto Trader. So is Tom Pierce trying to do yeah. a deflection here? Was it really anybody doing these har yeah. harassing phone calls? Yeah, <laughs> we just don't know. We we do not know, and you're correct. That apparently that was the 31st of October was the last day that Teresa was going to work for Auto Trader. Is that correct, Big Jeff? Uh, well, uh, that's according to Pierce. That, that's, I don't know if yes. that's correct or not. She, she certainly didn't tell anybody uh, <laughs> that that was the yes. case. Anybody uh, else? <laughs> um, yeah. Mill Billy, do you have a comment? I, I don't buy that because if that was her last day of working for Auto Trader, why is she rescheduling appointments? Yes, that's a very, <laughs> that's a very good point. Uh, Kelly, do you have a comment? Exactly what Mill Billy was just saying. It contradicts her apparently pulling over in the side of the road and documenting on rescheduling that lady that apparently was on the day planner that day for future work if she wasn't coming back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, um, it seems very suspicious indeed. Bibi, do you have a comment? Well, well, she could possibly still have to take note of that because after she's done, she faxes that back in, I believe, to them. Her yes. day planner. So yes. she would be like... Even if they knew she was quitting, she'd be doing that anyway. So that way, who yeah. gets the job next goes and takes care of it or whoever's That's covering true. it. Yeah, it could and just be. She, yeah. And she tried to tell, she supposedly told Pierce a couple weeks beforehand that Halloween would be her last day. Her last day. Her last right. day. Yeah. And it's only him that says that. So Yes. That, that is true. So there's no real form of corroboration with uh, Tom Pierce's statement. A big Jeff, do you have a comment? I, I, I do. Uh, I think all that uh, that BB said is quite uh, is quite plausible. Um, Auto Trader certainly hasn't hasn't identified who they were going to have um, replace uh, her. As, so as maybe, a replacement. maybe they were well, they were calling Kathy Williford, maybe. Um, but, <laughs> but, 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 yes. but I mean, it, since, since we since she, we don't know who that person is and there probably wasn't one. Uh, yeah. How could she be so sure that person was even hired to come out and, and perform that Thursday appointment? Which that, that's yeah. very strange. What's also yes. very strange is she doesn't tell anybody. And she, and she no. had been. We know that she had been out to the Avery's teens of Previously. times, many times, many times. Correct. And correct. And we also know that Stephen uh, called her uh, for the hustle yes. shots on her, on her personal cell phone several yes. times, and she made more money. And she liked. She preferred the hustle shots. Don't you yes. think she, if if that were you and she and you were conscientious that you would say, "Hey, Stephen, you know this is my last day. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm right. not doing hustle shots anymore." <laughs> well, that, that is correct. Well, yeah. it, um, it, unless yes, it was maybe. a pre-planned thing that she was going to disappear on that day. Yeah, and she screwed yeah. up because well, he has Alzheimer's and said she said that's that. True. That's true. I don't know. But, Just say, but. I'm, yeah, but unfortunately, it remains an area that's been under investigated. No one's really looked into it. Milbilly, do you have a comment? Well, it's obvious that they chose not to investigate things they should. Yeah. Just just from, the, like, hearing the people call on the dispatch with tips. Yes. That the dispatchers are screening what they're going to pass on to officers. Yes. Like, like when the lady calls about her, Teresa's friend calls, says that a number called her. It was all nines. That's Dispatch, correct. Dispatcher's like, well, you should call your phone company and check with them. 
pretends to write her information down, hangs up. Lady calls back about five minutes later. Like, yeah, I just called my phone company. They have no answers for me. And I'm concerned because Teresa's my friend. And what I heard on this conversation yes, got me wondering if then she takes down her information. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's rather, remo- and Milbili, you're in a, a, almost a very unique position with doing all the research that you've done on the phone calls. Um, would you say that this, from what you've listened to, Milbili, would you say that this was accidental or a deliberate ploy by law enforcement, even early on in the investigation? Well, I believe everything was constructed and plotted and planned on the 3rd. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's not, it cannot be a coincidence. Uh, a lot of people are turning their backs on information, tips, um, and it's all out there. You know, you go mm-hmm. through the trial, you read the, you read the testimonies, you look at the CASO report. Um, there's been a lot of dead leads, not followed up at all. And you could sense that frustration in the defence. Well, and, the defence had none of this Calumet County dispatch calls. None of it. Not a single piece of it. Yes. And if I'm guarantee if they would have heard that phone call on the ninth about them finding bones two and a half miles away from the property, they yes. would have used that in trial. Uh, correct. Correct. Um, and of course we discussed the, the bones found at the Manitowoc County gravel pit, and we know how the state deflected that and how Ken Kratz said he's not going to spend any more than 20 seconds because he knew that that was extremely damaging. Big Jeff, do you have a comment? I, I, I do with regard to your uh, question that you asked about how uh, was this law enforcement uh, set up? Did it ha- was it yeah. happening early on? Um, yes. De- Deb Strauss called. Uh, Deb Strauss, DCI agent, co-author of Peg Logger's uh, uh, exo- whitewashed exoneration report to say I, Stephen Avery's name keeps on coming up. Um, yes. I, I, I'm going to offer my, I'm not sure if it's legal, but I'm even going to offer my services. I wonder if Millbilly yes. can remind us what the date of that call was. Uh, she calls just Millbilly. before just before midnight on the fourth. On the fourth, the night before the car is found. What a shock! Right. So, will you yeah. get early? How early do you want to go? Right. Yeah. <laughs> and she's brought right in. Yeah. The day exactly. of the infamous Cuss Road. She's there for about an hour. She signs in. About 8 a.m. Then Ryan and Scott sign in. They're there for about an hour. They sign out. And right after that, five minutes later, she leaves. Yep. This, I mean, you know, again, I just want to echo and and thank Kaboom and also yourself, Millbilly, for your excellent work that you've done regarding those phone calls because we're now starting to see much more um, pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. Uh, But I just want to get back to the phone calls. This is pretty remarkable. What you've got here is an ex-boyfriend going through Teresa's records. Uh, He apparently guessed the password, got into her text, and he would have the ability to delete texts. Uh, is that the case, Big Jeff? Could Ryan Hilligus have potentially deleted texts? I, I, I do not believe that that service had access to the text, uh, the te- her text messages. The voicemails, yes. The text messages, no. That, that's my understanding of how Singular worked back then. I could be wrong. Right. So voicemails could be deleted. Correct. All right. Now, if you're an ex-boyfriend and you had phoned Teresa a few days or even during the day that she was reported missing and you had made threatening comments or whatever, would it have been in Ryan Hilligus's uh, interest to delete them, to delete those texts, to delete those voicemails? <laughs> What do you think? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's pretty obvious that what 
uh, potentially if Ryan Hilligus was the one harassing uh, Theresa Horbach for whatever reasons, um, you would want to sanitize those comments because if law enforcement heard them, they would be pointing a finger at you. So it's very interesting that he did this fairly early on and deleted uh, voicemails. Now, I don't believe he was actually asked to disclose what those voicemails were. Is that right, guys? Yeah, I, well, I don't believe he. he I don't believe well, he confessed. Did he, did he confess? Biggest question. The thing confessed? I have, the thing I have a problem with the transcripts for the trial. I wish they listed when things are happening if or not the jury was present. Uh, yes, because we don't know. Yes. Yeah, in a lot of cases, guys, uh, during the testimonies, um, Ken Kratz in particular um, told the judge we want to be heard outside the presence of the jury. So a lot of conversations took place, but without the presence of the jury. Um, from what I've read, um, Ryan Hilligus did not disclose anything of what he heard um, on those texts, but quite clearly, he was asked, okay, why did you listen to her voicemails? Uh, because he wanted to find out, you know, where she had gone, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so someone, though, deleted texts, uh, voicemails. Either, well, it couldn't have been Mike because he said he didn't delete any messages. That leaves one person and one person only, Ryan Hilligus. Guys, does anyone make, want to make any comments about that? Big Jeff. I completely concur with that uh, analysis. I don't, I don't believe he fessed up to it. Um, uh, so they, I, I, be, I believe that that was sort of left to the imagination who might have done it, but I don't think it could have been anyone else but him. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he's your Denny suspect, number one, an ex-boyfriend. And it must have been very frustrating for the defense because normally, and if you look at the statistics, um, a lot of people are killed by those that love them, apparently love them, or who are close to them. And yet, here we go, an ex-boyfriend who happens to be friends of her room partner and who just happens to be at her house. Mill Billy, do you have a comment? Well, it's every time Scott Blodorn or Ryan Hilgis is talking to a dispatcher, you yes. hear one or the other right there in the background. Yes. And that's as early as 5 o'clock on the 3rd. Right. Okay. And so there's another thing about that. Like, okay, Leslie Lemieux responds to the hall box, and at 5.07, she calls in the information Teresa's info and her plates yes. and everything. Yes. Two minutes after she calls in the info with her plates, you got Scott Blodorn calling dispatch, wanting to get in contact with Lisa the Mew because she's got that plate info for her. Yes. Yep. Just yeah, a lot of yeah. Nothing, Sorry, nothing at like the way things happen just make me go, huh? Yep. But it's remarkable, though, and Milbilly, you raise a very good point, and I'm still mystified. Um, Scott Blodorn was her um, partner, that, that they were living in the same place together. And it's remarkable that no one decides to phone up um, to find out why she has been missing for the last few days. And it's remarkable that once Karen calls in, the mother, everything starts to happen at a real rapid pace. And one has to wonder when Ryan got into those phone records. Does anyone know the actual date uh, he actually uh, logged in and heard those messages? Uh, Big Jeff. He, he, he had the, the place where Ryan, Ryan is actually the one who produces the call log uh, by uh, yes, early he printed them pre off. print. Yes. Yeah, my, my understanding that ha that's on the third. But he gives it to Uyghur on the third. Uh, Millbilly, please on correct me. On the third. Think, yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, Millbilly, do you have another comment? No, no, no. 
Okay, so we can see here that very early on, uh, Ryan is getting into her phone records, probably listening to all the messages and likely deleting certain messages. Uh, I just want to say that if you did that in Australia and you're a third party, uh, that's prison time. Uh, Kelly, would you like to back me up on that? What do you think? If you tried that stunt in Australia, getting into someone's oh, absolutely. phone records. Oh, yeah. yeah, you can't even... Re you can't even record anyone. If you, let's say you're on the phone to a friend even and you have a voice recorder going on and you show anyone that, they can actually sue you for that because you're breaching private confidentiality of their phone yes. calls. It is such a big no-no in Australia. Yes, it is very much so. And it was remarkable and um, how Ryan Hilligus, um, he didn't even really care uh, and he basically disclose what he did. Big Jeff, do you have a comment? Yeah, I do. Um, my, my recollection, and I always defer to, to Millbilly, who has encyclopedic knowledge of this case, uh, <laughs> is, is, is that the, the, the reason that they, uh, one of the reasons that they know that the voicemail was deleted, other, you know, was deleted was because somebody actually called, and I believe it was on the second, and that call went into voicemail. Uh, she was probably yeah. getting a lot of calls uh, yeah. at that, you know, uh, that were that were going unanswered, being in business for herself. So, the, an indication yes. that a call went into voicemail would be an indication that probably that voicemail was deleted within a few hours of uh, of, of that call. So, I strongly suspect that that was the second that that voicemail was deleted, and she hadn't right. even been reported missing yet. So, why, why are voicemails being deleted yes. before she's even reported? Yep, missing? that that's and, correct. That's correct. Uh, Mill Billy, do you have a comment? Well, he he pretty much said what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, the, there's no question. Uh, Bibi, do you have a comment? Well, if you take the date of the second, that's also supposedly when the missing poster was created. Uh, as well. Yes, yes, that's right. I mean, it's remarkable how things rapidly uh, escalated. But, um, you know, if you said something, if you had phoned up Teresa, and you said something incriminating, you would want to make sure that you deleted those messages. And oh, yes, that, yeah. yeah, yeah, and that is illegal. And I don't think anything um, happened to Ryan Hilligus for going, in fact, even the brother of going into the phone record. So several people had listened to those messages, and it's likely, very likely, that Ryan Hilligers was deleting messages as well. Mir Willie, do you have a comment? Those messages could have contained anything. It could have been something that made her look, made her look bad. It may have nothing to do with anything. Yes. It's, yes. But the fact that it happened and that it's ignored. Another yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah, I agree with you, Mill Billy. It, it goes to show how the investigation was really poorly done. Um, Bibi, do you have a comment? Still at a time, too, during this time frame. I don't believe he's really told anyone that he is an ex-boyfriend yet, because at first he doesn't say that he is. He's yeah. just a family friend. And, yeah. and he also moved immediately into her house. Uh, correct. Uh, Mill Billy, do you have a comment? Yeah, and at first, uh, Karen and her husband were taking all the charge of all the family stuff. And then they switched it over to Ryan Hillius. Right. And then he had a personal one-on-one -on -one conversations. People would call into dispatch about stuff, and she'd call Ryan Hillius directly. Yeah, that's phenomenal. That is phenomenal. And when, when one thinks about it, um, and Kelly might be able to comment about this, uh, we've had many cases in Australia whereby spouses, um, husband or wives or children have gone missing, as in disappeared. And then the news media shows up and they talk to either the husband or the wife and both the husband and the wife very early on um, get very defensive and they, they cry in front of the camera and, you know, they're pleading for their loved one to come back, et cetera, et cetera. 
only to discover days or weeks later it was that person who pleaded for the return of their loved one that was responsible for killing them. Kelly, do you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, I remember there was a case on that. I'm pretty sure it was the um, – if, if it's the one you're thinking about, it was the one with the – I think it was the – what was it, the father – or the yeah. stepfather or something and it was the mother and it was the child and again they were saying we miss her we want her we want her and it yes. turns out it was him that killed her the whole entire time yes and yep. yeah i totally agree with what you're saying so yeah they just deflect deflect try to come across as the mourners the worried yes. the worrying some ones and the whole time they're it was yes, I know exactly. What yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's ab- absolutely horrific because when you do see them being interviewed, that they, they look genuine. They've got a lot of remorse. They're crying. They're distraught, and they're the ones that have committed the crime. They're the ones that have killed their partner, so they're able to disguise it. A uh, BB, do you have a comment? That that goes on here a lot too. Yeah. Uh, I believe Chris Watts was pleading for his family in the beginning too. oh yeah 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 that, that, but, that yeah lots horrific. of cases here yeah this is a, a no yeah but chris watts when he when, when he did his first police or tv interview yes i i knew right away he was guilty yeah you could just tell by his demeanor yeah correct correct and and the uh, big jeff do you have a comment I, I do. Uh, Paul, Paul Capaldi often talks about a case in the uh, UK um, where the parents were out there doing exactly that, you know, pleading for the return. And they made the mistake of talking about the the missing person who ended up being dead. And I think it was a child. Yes. In the past ten. And oh, that, yes. And, this, and, and that, that was enough to cue investigators to say, why would you be talking about her in the past, uh, the, the missing child in the past tense? Mm-hmm. And that happened that not only him, my callback kind of did that. Yes. Karen Hallback yes. did that. Uh, yes, but you know, here we choose to hide behind. You know, we give the we give the family their distance, especially this family. Uh, oh yeah, oh yeah. For for some un, for some unknown reason, uh, a lot of um, a lot of rope is given to the Hallback family. A lot of forgiveness is given to the Hallback family. And what I found remarkable was how um, Mike Horbach, who was the family spokesman, the amount of times he was laughing on camera, I believe in ca- even Karen Horbach was caught laughing on camera so early on, uh, I found that very disturbing indeed. Oh, there's a... No, Billy. They're bringing Brendan Dassey out in the hallway to the courtroom. Why is they bringing him out where the public can see him in the first place? I don't know. Yes. Yes. But they got Karen Hallbach standing there and they walk right by with Brendan and she yes. smiles. She was laughing. Yeah. Yeah. Like if that was somebody that potentially killed my daughter. Yep. I'd have to be restrained. Correct. There's um, no question about that. BB, thank you, Milton. That That was explained in an interview. That Mike did with the press, and not a recorded one, but a typed one, um, with the newspaper or something. And he said, yes. oh, because they told that joke about cutting up Teresa or hiding her body, the one with Bobby and uh, Michael. Uh, then he says that yeah. they even made a joke about uh, Brendan being found guilty, and even his mom got a laugh out of it. Yeah. This is one hell of a strange case in which people show some rather bizarre emotions. But I'm I'm yeah, I'm with Melbourne a hundred percent. I mean how could you listen to that? No, you can't laugh, you know. No. You 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 cannot. You cannot. And look, I just want to make a couple of comments about Ryan. Well, we can spend four hours on just Ryan. Right. Uh, and also, I just want to put a plug for Thirsty for Theory Thursday. What a magnificent job uh, you guys have done on those podcasts, uh, especially looking at uh, potential Denny suspects. 
If you haven't um, listened to it, guys, please come and listen to them. They were brilliant. Uh, yes, BB. Um, uh, we're uh, approaching the hour point. I'm not sure if I think Kaboom had a, a meeting. Oh, yes. Uh, Kaboom, Kaboom, do you have any comments before you have to leave? No, I'm good. I can stay for a bit more. Oh, fantastic. You know. uh, fantastic. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Kaboom. I just want to couple of make, make a couple of comments in regarding Ryan. Now, he was pretty open and honest about the fact that he was listening to messages. Now, think about it. He actually, he downplayed his relationship with Teresa. He just basically said, oh, he was a, you know, a good friend for, you know, considered a good friend for about four or five years. Um, and he also downplayed the romance uh, between uh, Scott Blowdorn and Teresa. Uh, you know, he just said, they were, oh, they were just friends. And yet within a very short time frame, Ryan Hilligus moves in, is checking phone records and Lord knows what else, and is likely deleting text mess or voicemail, sorry, from her phone. And he was asked, when was the last time he had seen Teresa? And correct me if I'm wrong, he couldn't remember the time of day, whether he went over at night time or during the morning. Millbilly, yeah. do you have any comments about that? Yeah, that's correct. He doesn't he doesn't remember he remember he had to go there to drop something off for Scott. Yes. Doesn't remember what it was and doesn't remember when it was, but he remembers the day, just doesn't know if it was morning, afternoon, or night. Yeah. Yeah. Um, BB, do you have a comment? Um, yeah, but he sure does remember her wearing that cowgirl costume. Uh yeah. Um, guys, uh, this might be nefarious of me, but does you does Ryan strike you as being a bit of a control freak? Well, it, he could have seen her in that cowboy outfit because dispatch uh, two people calling stating that she was seen at a bar on Friday. She was also seen at a bar on Saturday. On Saturday, and okay. typically right what? here in Wisconsin, that's when you're going to go out to the parties at the bars is the See, Friday and Saturday Halloween. before Halloween. Yeah. Right, Adult beforehand. Halloween is the weekend beforehand. Right. Unless unless Halloween happens well on a Friday or a Saturday. But yes. other than that, it's the weekend beforehand. Right. Okay. So I have a lot of concern about Ryan, but uh, we'll continue that. We'll, we'll revisit Ryan again. So, guys, if we have a look at slide 139, to me, this was remarkable. So what they did is they called up Laura uh, and she was the manager, manageress for Singular Wireless. And I've never seen Ken Kratz so upset, so uptight in regards to the voicemails. He made a big song and dance during the trial. And in actual fact, when Jerome Buting was talking to Laura, uh, Ken Kratz got up and he said to the judge that he wanted to be heard outside the presence of the jury. Now, let's think about this. We have a missing person. She may or may not have been murdered at this stage. We don't know. This is during a trial where the jury is meant to be hearing pertinent information. Panel, I want to ask this. Why would Ken Kratz tell the judge he wanted to talk about the messages outside the jury? Has anyone got an answer? Christy, Christy. There was, there, was some, there was something in those messages he wanted to hide. There was information he didn't want the jury to know. Yep. Okay. So well, what, what type of information, make, Christy? Something that would make Stephen Avery not look guilty. Exactly. Any, anything, that, anything that pointed away from Stephen Avery was intentionally ignored. It was. Yes, you're correct. You're absolutely correct. Um, yeah, so uh, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? I, I, I do. That, that's the, the discussion at that time was the famous uh, CFNA call. 
which yes. is not a term that's used in the cellular industry, by the way. That's that is uh, an acronym that they made up on the spot. Can you and, can uh, you explain that, Big Jeff? Yeah. Can you explain? I, that? I, I can. I can. Um, the uh, I, I, even on uh, calls today, but even more more so uh, back at the time, uh, you used to get billed for your cellular minutes even when you had an incoming call, right? Yes. Um, and so one of the features that you used to have on the, on the flip phones and the candy stick phone formats was if your phone would ring, you'd see the number, or you didn't want to talk to that person, you could divert that call directly to voicemail without having okay. to pick up the phone and costing yes. you money. So yes. that, that's the, um, so, so the, 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 what they did was they labeled that uh, call forwarded, not answered. Uh, okay. The, call forwarding that, that, yeah, yeah. Right. well it's not call yes. forwarding because it's because call forwarding would be that you pre-program your phone to, okay. to bounce to another number right okay uh, okay and, and they're saying that that, that this, there was an active button pressed on her phone that diverted the call directly to voicemail uh, with, without, without it having been answered right so that so right. they, they can tell they can tell the difference uh in okay. in the way that that call was registered through, through the tower um, that it was diverted right. back because her phone would have had to that the, the, the her phone would have acknowledged the tower and it would have acknowledged her pressing a button uh, well, on, the, on the phone to divert the, well, the call back to the centralized voicemail server yeah. well big jeff big jeff while you're there i want to ask you a question because uh jerome buting said her voicemail was picked up on november the second this caused um ken kratz to almost have a stroke Right, he he literally changed color, uh, and the judge said to him, Judge Willis said to him, "Does the state know who accessed the voicemails?" And basically, Ken Kratz had no answer. Now, this is a murder investigation, and where you're trying to find out pertinent and relevant information, and quite clearly, Ken Kratz had no idea of how to respond. Big Jeff, can you tell me what is the significance of the voicemail being picked up on November the 2nd? Well, uh, <laughs> it, it obviously is that um, if, if people think that uh, it was her that picked it up, then she would still be alive. On, on the Correct. Second, right? but, <laughs> Correct. Uh, but if the, the, I mean, that, that whole shenanigans with the way that that went down, I think, Maybe, uh, I think Christy has a very clear recollection of it. Maybe she should talk about it a little bit. How Kratz deflected this, uh, and it was, you know, yet another brilliant deflection by Kratz, who's not really oh, interested yeah. in justice. He's just interested in winning the game. Uh, yeah, well, he Christy, tries. He tries, he tries to argue. Uh, well, if to stay, if they're trying to say that she was still alive, yes, we we sh we, we should have been known about this so we could look into it. <laughs> I. I don't know about you guys, but I was completely stunned. And it, you see, this was such an important point. And it's a pity that the defense, well, actually, the defense tried to use it to their advantage. Uh, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? Well, I, I, if you were getting to the end, go right ahead, because I'm, my blood's boiling right now about the way this ended. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I was trying to get at here was that several things happened. There's no doubt that Ken Kratz knew information about those calls. It had to be because he turned white as a ghost. He told the jury, he told the judge he wanted to be heard outside of the jury. So quite clearly, he knew that there must have been information that did not point to Stephen Avery. So it was damaging. But the remarkable thing is this. He Ken Kratz even said about, well, you know, we needed to know whether Teresa Horbach was alive on, on November the 2nd, et cetera, et cetera, which is incredible for a, an attorney, a prosecuting attorney to admit in front of a judge. But what I found remarkable was this. What Judge Willis said when, when Jerome Butin was saying, well, you know, what happened? Who picked up her uh, her voicemail on November the 2nd? The judge said, and I quote, he had trouble seeing the apparent relevance. Um, Big Jeff, uh, is your blood still boiling? Oh, my God. 
you ever see the cartoons where the person's head like turns into one of those steam whistles? That's what's happening to me right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, uh, Tourette's is about to set in. Tourette's is about to set in. Uh, Christy, do you have a comment? No, I just wanted to laugh at Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> Thank okay. You. So, so, um, so he, here, guys, um, here's the insanity of this whole trial. Right? Clearly, something is important. Something important has happened um, during those messages. Someone must have said something incriminating, because it's pretty obvious that Ryan Hilligus got onto it pretty quick, smart. He obviously was listening in, and he had del- he must have deleted calls. Now, uh, Mike Hallbach admitted he listened to all the messages, didn't disclose what those messages were, and he admitted he didn't erase any messages at all. Quite clearly, Ken Kratz was extremely upset when it came to the calls. And in actual fact, he even said to the judge, how does this help us to find who the killer is. I just stood there with my mouth gaping open. So Ken Kratz not only manipulated uh, the judge, he prevented the jury from hearing any of this information. Now, what Ken Kratz did, um, he continuously evoked uh, a particular rule called 904.03. Does anyone know what that rule actually is? You got us on that one. You stumped the panel, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, just, I decided to have a look at what that actually is. And guys, can we have a look at slide 140? And I'll read it out for our, uh, he, he continuously quoted this particular um, rule, uh, which is 904.03. Uh, and it, I'll quote, it says, exclusion of relevant evidence on grounds of prejudice, confusion, or waste of time. Although relevant, evidence may be excluded if its probative value is substantially outweighed by the danger of unfair prejudice, confusion of the issues, or misleading the jury, or by considerations of undue delay, waste of time, or needless presentation of cumulative evidence. Um, Guys, I'm not a lawyer, but does anyone know what the hell that means? Bibi? That law needs to go. That's what that means. That law needs to go or be changed or reformed because that's yeah. BS. That's just a load of crap right there. Yeah. So in other words, because Ken Kratz was always uh, evoking 904.03, the judge was sort of saying, well, you know, guys, and that probably what prompted the judge to say he had trouble seeing the apparent relevance. And that's it conversation regarding those phone calls was effectively over. Guys, does anyone have any comments about that? Big Jeff. The, the, one, of the, one of the biggest comments I have, and I've been through that tar- the trial testimony in the cellular area, very, with a fine tooth comb many times. And uh, that so-called expert that they kit that had from Singular, that store manager that they had, yes. she was a dope. She 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 didn't even know how the system how the how the phone network worked. I mean, she's like stumbling yes. all over the place. Uh, I don't know. That's the best yes. expert they could come up with in a murder trial, really. Yes. Yeah, I know. It, it's very disappointing. Mill Billy, do you have a comment? It's Kratz. He he picks and chooses who he calls and prepares that is them. Correct. That is correct. Yep. Yeah. Uh, normally during a trial, guys, what happens is that the uh, defense and also the um, state can call up any witnesses they want. What they normally do is they coach them. They tell them what questions they're going to ask. They already know the answers to their responses. Um, So they can pick and choose whoever they want. But I like to let the listeners know to our podcast, I'm sorry, but I think... A, ve- a lot of very important clues as to who potentially killed Teresa Horbach 
were erased. And it's likely Ryan who had erased critical um, voicemails. We probably will never know the contents of those messages unless Ryan can be subpoenaed to testify. Because quite clearly, if you've got the lead prosecutor here, Ken Kratz, being visibly upset, he turfed out the jury and he tried to suppress Buting from continuing. Quite clearly, Ken Kratz was privy to information that nobody else knows. Big Jeff. I, it, it's just amazing. I mean, you you know what his answer is going to be if he's subpoenaed. I don't recall. If, if he can't recall yeah. <laughs> yes. well, that the events of October 30th, whether he was there day or night, or even what he was dropping off, as Billy said, how's he yeah. going to remember what voicemail, the, the voicemails he listened to 10 years ago? You know? Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and I feel that now so much time has gone by. Uh, we've really lost the ability on a lot of potential leads where they may go. And that's a frustration that the defense stated over and over again. Leads were not investigated. And guys, it quite clearly shows the tunnel vision nature of this investigation from very, very, very early on. Okay, guys, let's continue. So Ken Kratz made a big song and dance regarding those phone messages. If we turn now to slide 141, and again, guys, we discussed this in our previous podcast, and this is the divisive point. When Teresa left the Avery salvage yard, and Stephen Avery always maintained that he saw her leave, Teresa Horbach came, took her photographs, he paid her, and he saw her leave. And yet that story is in complete contrast to what his own nephew said. Now, Bobby Dassey decided to become part of the narrative very early on by stating that, no, he saw Teresa head towards Stephen Avery's trailer and that he noted that her vehicle was still there. So, in effect, Bobby Dassey was a star witness for the state. So that's the divisive point right there. That's the critical turning point for the entire investigation. Quite clearly, if Stephen Avery is correct, that is, I saw her leave, then clearly the lens of the investigation is going to focus on somebody else. That somebody else has to now be Bobby Dassey. Because Bobby Dassey inserted himself into the narrative and he said, no, 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 no. I saw her walk towards Stephen Avery's trailer. Guys, do we have any comments? Big Jeff. Not, not that I am trying to defend Bobby Dassey, <clears throat> excuse me, but in the phone calls um, you, we, uh, that, that Kaboom had foyed, yes. we definitely hear um, the fact that uh, Bar Barb, and one where Barb is talking to Stephen uh, at the yes. jail, that Bobby yes. was really, really um, pressured uh, in one particular interview that he had on the ninth. Um, yeah. So who who knows what they pressured him into doing and saying, and you know what they what they threatened him with. Now I happen to you know c concur with uh, Milbilly's theory <laughs> uh, that uh, you know he, he, that he's probably the one that did it or certainly played a part in it but that being yeah. said it's it uh he, he whether he injected himself into it or whether he was brought into it sort of against kicking dragged. and screaming against his whether will, he was dragged was, into it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, christy do you have a comment yeah just like jeff said in the calls um in one of the calls barbara is talking to steven and she's even letting steven know that Bobby doesn't even want to come home because of how bad law enforcement went after him. And I'm absolutely yeah. not sticking up for him either. Um, I have a lot of inconsistencies with him. I don't know if he did it or if he didn't, but I definitely have problems with him. But law yes. enforcement did supposedly go after him pretty hard. They went after everybody really hard. Yes, they did. They did. Emil Billy, do you have a comment? Thank you, Christy. 
Well, as early as the ninth, when they're taking Barb to the hospital, they're telling her, well, your son is one of the last two people to see this girl alive. Yep. And they're grilling her. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yep. Um, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? Thank you, Mill Billy. What was were you done, Mill Billy? I apologize. No, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So, so I think this is yet. Uh, it, it, it when when we talk to the guilters, it's always wonderful to point out the state's uh, increasing pile of BS, right? Um, yes. But, so, so if if you if you read the Dietering uh, report um, on uh, Bobby's Bobby's interview on the night. Wasn't that bad. It's probably about a page, page and a half, something like that, of uh, worth of an interview. Um, yes. And uh, th that uh, the a FOIA had been done several times for the electronic copy of the of the actual recording, similar to what we got from Earl Avery. Yes. The state had insisted that that interview was not recorded, and that then that didn't exist. There's but no. We, there's no match. Yes, to Billy. Really. When, no, when Henberry when Henberry got his um pictures released guess what we saw a picture of you want to tell yeah. us no billy <laughs> yeah. yeah it's an evidence tag of bobby dassey's interview tape right the yeah. tape we took the picture of the tape, tape recording <laughs> yeah. tape <Yes>. itself <laughs> yes yeah and and, oh, and, yeah, if, if, and if you read queso they don't mention anything about talking to earl avery at all mm-hmm there's yes. no, there, there's no, all they say is they took him to the hospital to get that's fingerprints right. and DNA, and that's it. Yes. Hey, yeah. Actually, don't the they people. actually say he refused to speak to us or something? The, and there's no mention about him hiding the day before. And all right. Who are, these, <laughs> the who, who are these officers referring to when they tell him? Well, it's a good thing you hid yesterday because we got somebody that was here with us yesterday. It's not here right now. And this works out better for you. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And uh, some, I'm um, reading some of the comments um, in, in our channel. And I think Miss Piggy really hit the mark here. You know, it's either you, Bobby, or your uncle. Uh, and it could have really been as simple as that. Um, so, you know, somebody just changes their uh, observations. Um, but there's no question that Bobby threw uh, his uncle under the bus. That was a very, very damaging uh, testimony that he gave. Now, remember, he had the ability to keep his mouth shut. As in, I saw nothing. I was in the shower or I was in bed, yet he decided to involve himself very early on in the piece. And of course, we know from the interviews done by, um, that were done um, when they were interrogating uh, Stephen, he mentioned Bobby straight away. He even mentioned on November the 9th and probably even earlier that he had seen Bobby's blazer gone. So it is interesting that very early on in the piece, both parties are mentioning each other, both Bobby and Stephen, right? So it's interesting how Bobby almost had to get involved because it's pretty obvious. If Stephen says, well, after Teresa left, I went over to my sister's place and I noticed that uh, Bobby's blazer had gone. Who do you think the police would have gone after then? All right, it's pretty obvious. Guys, do we have any comments about that? Big Jeff. The police had their sights set on a different uh, suspect who was about to uh, expose the, co the, the uh, county for corruption in a big way. Yeah. <laughs> that's not, that's yeah. not the right guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, well, look, let, let's, let's don't beat about the bush here, guys. It is possible that the MTSO and the investigators are protecting a potential suspect, as in someone who had first-hand knowledge of the death of Teresa Horbach or the death of the victim in this particular case. There's only one person on that salvage yard who had a massive lawsuit against the county, and that was Stephen Avery. And it's remarkable 
how Ken Kratz approached this. When he gave his opening remarks, he trivialized what had occurred in Stephen's past, basically stating, oh, well, yeah, he was falsely accused of um, the sexual assault of Penny, but that has got nothing to do with this trial. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He also had a massive civil lawsuit against the county, but don't worry about that. That past has got nothing to do with this. So again, his approach was very consistent. He tried to minimize everything that had occurred in Stephen's past that led up to this particular situation. He basically tried to wipe the slate and treat this as completely an isolated incident. And that clearly is complete nonsense. Guys, do we have any comments about that? A big Jeff. As usual, right? <laughs> um, I, I just, th this is a really good point to bring up um, Zellner's uh, recent filing. And yes. the, uh, ha had uh, Puting and Strang had, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Veely CD where they could have seen the <laughs> types of stuff that they could have impeached Bobby's testimony. And what, uh, yeah. what, what an incredible, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, benefit that would have been to Steven. Say, hey, look, <laughs> this is what you're looking yeah. up on the Internet. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But you got to remember, Vili was also yeah, given a list of words to look for when he yes. searched the computer. Yes. Uh, Christy, do you have a comment? Big Jeff, I don't remember the exact number, but wasn't it confirmed somewhere that Bobby was home and alone? Or Bobby was the only one home for like 76% of those searches or something like that? Yes. Yep. yep. Yes. Majority yes. of them had between 6 a.m. and... 2.30 p.m. when Bobby yep. was the only one home and he was sleeping. Yes. yes. Yep, the remarkable thing, um, and I'm sure the listeners are aware of it, uh, whenever you go on the internet, there's a log kept. There's a log kept on your computer. There's a log kept by your ISP, and it's time stamped. So no matter what website you go to, unless you're using a VPN, your IP address is recorded. And that's why now, and, and um, uh, people can back me up, um, there are new laws now in which that data has to be collected, I think, for five years. So therefore, your ISP, if you're um, involved in some type of criminal activity, uh, the ISP has to keep that data for, I think, five years. That means that whatever website you go to, whatever you download, whatever you view, there's a record kept. Therefore, and time stamped. Therefore, they know whoever's investigating knows what website has been accessed, what has been downloaded, and when. Well, Zelna, uh, expert who did a forensic analysis of the hard drive, the DASI hard drive, they can establish when certain material was viewed, downloaded. It just so happened, as Christy and Big Jeff and Mill Billy alluded to, the majority of that was when Bobby Dassey was home. We don't know whether he was home alone or whether somebody else was there. But it matched to him being home because we know that he did a late shift. We know that his other brothers were at school and we know that his mum was at work. Also that um, uh, Stephen uh, worked with his brothers, with his mum, his dad, they were in the salvage yard, right? So it meant that whoever was accessing that very violent uh, pornographic material uh, happened to be at the time where Bobby Dassey was home. Big Jeff. We also happen to know that, the, that despite his 2017 lie uh, in his interview, the computer was in his bedroom. We have the pictures in the video. That is correct. Uh, Christy, do you have a comment? And we also further know with the recent calls gotten by Kaboom that Barb's claim that I didn't even have bleeping internet is yes. untrue as well. 
Uh, that's correct. In fact, in fact, um, Big Jeff, if I could just make a comment. Uh, back in the day, uh, when you had that type of internet, you needed a phone line. And I believe there's a video that actually shows a phone line coming down from the wall, heading towards the computer, which means that they did indeed have the internet. Now, I have to admit, uh, back then in, you know, 2004, 2005, the internet was still pretty primitive. Uh, by that, I mean that um, if you went on the internet, you couldn't do a normal, you couldn't use your normal phone line. It basically tied up your phone line. Later um, on when, yeah, big, uh, big. Um, actually, there was a, a, a program you could get because I used to use dial-up. I lived out in the country back yes. in that same time, Brent. And uh, we would dial up to even a free number. Uh, so you might not even know that you had it or that your kids were using it. Um, yes. Uh, then uh, there was a gadget you could get that you downloaded on your computer. And it would uh, it was a caller ID. And then you could pick to dump the Internet and let the call come into the house and answer it or okay. to let it go like to voicemail yes. and then yeah. stay on the Internet. And that might explain yeah. why there were so many little time fragments of yes. him using the computer throughout the day because he might have been getting bumped off with that caller ID thing yes. and then answering the cost. Yep. And I'd just like to highlight while we're here, uh, those computer searches did not stop on the 31st of October. They still continued. And material was accessed on the 31st as well, okay, the day that Teresa uh, arrived to take the pictures. So someone was accessing that material even on the 31st and after, so it didn't stop, which was very, very interesting. All right, so again, we can spend many, many hours talking about the computer and uh, the information that was accessed, but you're correct. Could you imagine if um, Strang and Buting had the contents of that information during the trial and then approached Bobby and said, okay, we know these are the things that occurred to the victim, as in uh, the victim was cut up, obviously mutilated, shot, burnt, whatever. How come... It's the same type of material that you or someone in your household has been searching. Could you imagine how powerful and how devastating that would have been? And um, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? <clears throat> right, right. Uh, I don't. I don't recall all the details. Uh, maybe somebody on the panel will. I hope so. Um, but Bobby actually got into Brendan's account and was uh, instant messaging as Brendan with one of his female classmates. Oh, that's correct. Uh, do you recall, do you recall the details of this? And, and he said some very disturbing things uh, to her with regard to, I want to play a game, that kind of thing. Uh, yes. Uh, does anyone on the panel uh, know the details? Uh, kaboom. Kaboom. Yeah, so it wasn't just Brendan's account he was using. It was also Blaine's. Um. Yes. Yeah, he was saying some pretty nasty stuff to a girl about, I, I think he had just watched that Saw movie and was trying to lure a girl out there. Oh, but yeah. I, yep. I, I feel it was more, I, I honestly feel that was more just playful than uh, anything. However, I wanted to talk about um, something to do with Brendan. So there was a motion in Lyman in Brendan's case where they sp speak about how Brendan made a comment to a girl, um, probably shouldn't name her, but uh, we'll just call her a girl. And okay. uh, yep, fair enough. He said uh, something to the effect of, "You might turn up like Teresa." Oh. And the assumption from them is that Brendan said this. However. I truly believe that was Bobby. And that's one of the things that actually does strike me yeah. in regards to Bobby. However, when this was presented to the judge, there was a slew of um, points made. 
And this is the only one that the judge did not rule on. Right. Right. Yeah, that's very interesting. Look, there's no doubt that Bobby did use his brother's accounts. Right? There's no question about that because his brother was elsewhere. So it couldn't have been Brendan using that account. Bobby was using that account. So, yes, and he, he did say a lot of inappropriate things to girls. But don't forget, on the computer, there were files. Um, I think there was a, there was a picture of Teresa. There was a p pictures of uh, Stephen. Uh, and also there was a file called DNA. So <laughs> that's pretty remarkable. Millbilly, do you have a comment? Yeah, they even questioned Blaine and them about that. Like, uh, did you create these folks? You got to remember, though, too, the computer had a password lock. Right. So, yeah. Uh, can I say something about that? Of, of course, people. A, a, a desktop computer back then, Windows, whatever, old Windows it was back at that time. Yep. The password was only to keep honest people honest. My kid showed me how. He could just pick cancel and bypass that and go right on in. Yeah, you can just uh, type in admin and you'll be good to go. Yeah, a generic password. Correct. But look, guys, we can devote an entire podcast to that. But clearly, uh, I think we all agree. Um, Bobby was, what, 18, 19 at the time? Um, I don't know about you guys, but if you're downloading that material, there's, there's something seriously wrong. Furthermore, if you are caught with that material in Australia, we're talking about jail time. No question about it. You're going to prison. If uh, Sammy, do you have a, a question? Well, uh, Dark Side of the Moon just yes. um, asked, she said, was anyone charged with drugs? Just wondering why narcotics was involved with this case. Well, oh, but, yeah, yeah. Bill Billy. Bill, hey, good well, question. If you, if you listen to the the transmissions for the Manitowoc County on the fifth, they strictly say we got Barb Yonda in custody, yeah. possession of THC. THC. Yeah, and it's not on a record. Yep. Yep. I'll, well, it looks like uh, Bill uh, Billy. Uh, yeah. And, sorry. And, Bill and they released her the same day. That's what I was going to say. Didn't they release her relatively quickly? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, they, re they release her, and then she calls the dispatch asking if she's able to retrieve her vehicle because it's stuck at the roadblock where she got detained. Yeah. Uh, look, um, a lot of things got expunged in that family. <laughs> yeah. Uh, a lot of people uh, turned the uh, blind eye, so to speak. Uh, and um, Dark Side of the Moon does ask an incredibly good question. And again, we can spend an hour on that. But if you notice, if you go through the logs, if you go through who actually responded first at the Avery Salvage Yard, uh, it's a huge contingent of narcotics detectives. They were everywhere. And we're not talking about minor narcotic detectives. We're talking about senior detectives were and investigators were all narcotics or ex narcotics. Yep. So, yep, Millbilly. Well, you got to think about it. Uh, the majority of the crimes that happen in these areas are drug related. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Back was, then, the heroin started to become real popular back then, along with meth. Meth, crystal meth, correct. Yes, correct. It was um, from, from, my reading, um, Wisconsin had a huge, may even still have a huge meth problem, and we also Dad. know, of course, yeah, it's more on the, it's more opiates now. Opiates, okay, okay, yeah, and uh, don't forget the basis of the Sean Rudy murder, murdering his wife. Uh, they were high on crystal meth. And, you know, this is back in the Teresa Horbach time as well. Um, so remember that crime spree that took place within a 12-day window. We have the death of three women. Uh, Teresa, now I'm saying that she's deceased. I understand and I appreciate other theories. Teresa, uh, Carmen Botwell, and Christine Rudy, three women dead 
within almost, 12 days? Almost four. Four? Almost four. Almost four? Yeah, Martinez's wife. Oh, yes, who got oh, attacked oh, by yeah. Binax. Nice. Binax, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. All right, guys. If we can, because I'm just being conscious of the time, excellent discussion. But now, if you thought things couldn't get any more stranger, have a look at slide 142. And this is when Special Agent Tom Fassbender was questioned. And uh, it it just simply is just remarkable. If you have a look at uh, the look on Ken Kratz's face, in a way, what they were trying to do is to justify why the investigative team were just focusing on just one person. And Special Agent Tom Fassbender even had the goal to say, well, you know, you're not going to lock and load. You're there to find the truth. And I just about fell over backwards in my chair thinking, no, you did everything but find the truth. And to make matters worse, this if you have a look at the smirk on Ken Kratz's face, this is what he said. Oh, so you focus your investigation because Stephen Avery was, to quote, the last person to see her alive. And, you know, Toph Spender says, well, you know, of course. So this, of course, made Buting furious. And he made the comment, he stated, uh, the police never investigated anyone who was close to her, which, of course, is the truth. Right? Guys, do we have any comments? Try and keep swearing to a minimum, please. He's got a comment. Big Jeff. What strikes me the most about Fassbender <clears throat> is he appeared on a very uh, recent, within the last uh, six months, special on MSNBC called Return to Manitowoc. <laughs> yes. He, did you see that? Um, I haven't seen that one yet. He Please tell us. He was asked the direct question, um, and this was about Brendan. Did you do it? Did you, did, you, did, that? did do you think that he did it? And you know what his answer was? I don't know. Oh, I don't yeah, know. Look, big Jeff, Big Jeff, you can see what's happening, right? The amount of pressure that these guys are now under from Kratz down, right? Ma'am, Ma'am 1 and 2 has exploded. And there are hundreds of thousands of people who are now putting a lot of heat on Kratz, the investigators, and now they're all backpedaling because they know what's coming. So now all of a sudden, everyone is now changing their mind, changing their opinions. But it's true. Here's the tragedy of the case. When Fassbender was questioned by Buting, he said, look, don't you normally investigate an ex-boyfriend? Yes, we do. Don't you investigate um, close friends? Uh, yes, we do. Don't you investigate um, roommates? and people that may have loved them, uh, yes, we do. But, guys, we can see that the investigators did everything but, right? They gave everyone a free pass, and they only focused on one person, and that was Stephen Avery. So it's remarkable that, on the one hand, they're quite happy to go in court, say, yeah, 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 in a normal investigation, we would do this and this and this. But the reality was they never did. Their focus immediately was on one person and one person alone. And it's disgusting and disingenuous that Ken Kratz, who put on that smirk, he he had done that several times by saying, now notice what he said, the last person to see her alive. That was his theme. That was his focus. So, in other words, he could justify why the investigators did not look anywhere else. Panel, do we have any comments? Okay, <laughs> we're all good. All right, so guys, let's have a look at slide 143. Now, again, this is truly remarkable. And 
if you have a look at Ryan Hilligus, have a look at the look on his face. Uh, I think that's, BB. what's that called? What type of delight is that called? Duper's Delight. Duper's Delight. That's Christy. what happens automatically to your face when, yes. you have, when you feel you have gotten away with telling a very brilliant lie. Yes. Uh, Christy, do you have a comment? That is the smuggest look I've ever seen. And when my children give it to me, it makes me want to just wipe it off of their face for them. And that's exactly what I think of. I just want to slap that look right off of his face. That second picture, the top middle one. Yes. I just, that is the one, that is the one facial expression of his that sticks with me through this whole case. Yeah. And in actual fact, he had done it several times, which is truly remarkable. But again, what we have here is a person. Uh, an ex-boyfriend. Now, let's don't muck around here. He obviously knew Teresa for quite a long time. I think they were um, high school sweethearts, as you can see in the bottom left-hand uh, picture. And uh, so he was an ex-boyfriend. And it just so happened that Teresa was now sharing uh, accommodation with Scott Blowdorn. And Scott Blowdorn just happened to be good friends with Ryan Hilligus. Uh, and Ryan downplayed his relationship with Teresa. And he also said that there was nothing romantic going on between Teresa and Scott. And we know that is a lie. So he trivialized his relationship with Teresa and he trivialized his friend's relationship with Teresa. Christy, do you have a point, a comment? Uh, earlier when we started talking about Ryan, you had asked if we thought he was controlling. And my first thought was that picture that you actually have in the lower left. And yes. that picture is very rigid and very tense. And he, it, she looks like a possession of his, not, that's not a loving arm around. I don't, it doesn't appear to be a loving arm around the shoulder posing for a picture. It, it, it appears to me to be a possession. This is mine. Stay away yes. from it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. It is. Um, now, I'm not sure whether Teresa had said anything about Ryan to her friends. That I don't know. Uh, Bibi, do you have a comment? He, he also, we mustn't forget, was reported to have gotten in a fight with somebody, uh, supposedly Bradley Chuck, at a party because of Teresa, too. Yeah. Yep. I'm not sure yep. where that account comes from, but. Yes. That well, shows aggression the, about her. Yes. Jealousy. Yes. Jealousy. Yep. Yes. Well, I mean, have a look. Have a look at this remarkable thing. Ryan Hillegas is an ex-boyfriend. Yet, we know, we can see in the picture on slide 143, on the top right hand, he became the go-to person for uh, searches. Right? So both him and Scott uh, drew maps, organized uh, searches. And Mill Billy, do you want to make any comments? Did people actually telephone him when it came to searches? Mill Billy, do you have a comment? Say it again. Uh... Um, did people, the public, phone him when it came to searches? Uh, right, well, uh, they they'd called dispatch, and they were instructed by the dispatchers to talk to him because he was handling yeah. all of it. Yes. Um, now that's rather remarkable, right? A person is missing. Uh, a search parties are meant to be done by law enforcement, and yet dispatch are telling people to talk to a member of the public, mm -hmm. right? who's an ex-boyfriend who normally would be on your suspects list, uh, don't you think that's a little strange, Millbilly? Nope. Yep. Just like when they have, they set up a website too. And uh, yes, somebody made some nasty remarks on the website and somebody seen it, called the dispatch yes. about it. The dispatcher in turn calls Ryan and inform him and he says oh yes we are we're well aware of it we've already taken it down but it yep. it it's just so strange how they're all 
in communications yeah. with each other. Well, here's the here's the thing, right? How smart is it that if you've had a hand uh, in the murder or disappearance of Teresa Hallbach, that you want to be as close as possible to law enforcement because they're keeping him yep. updated on what they're doing. And, so in a, and if yeah, you look at really. all the evidence tags when they retrieve something from Teresa's house, who's yes. giving it? Who's giving it to him? Uh, well, it's Ryan and Scott, right? So the remarkable thing is he, well, he had, well, Teresa was missing for several days. So it's disingenuous that uh, law enforcement are telling uh, on the stand, well, the reason why we couldn't find any forensic evidence of Teresa uh, was because uh, Stephen and Brendan had five days to clean up. Well, Ryan and Scott had, what, three days? a little bit more to clean up their tracks if they've done anything nefarious. So before anyone knew, they had plenty of time to do things. For example, delete messages, clean things up, remove things. Bibi, do you have a comment? No, I'm good. It got covered. Okay. So now we have Ryan Hilligus and Scott Blodorn who are – uh, in charge of the investigative team, right? So it's rather remarkable that if we have a look at slide 144, you can see that there's a huge contingent of people um, who are involved in searching for Teresa Hallbach. And like I said, I, comp I, I know I may be wrong, but I compare this to uh, Christine Rudy. Who was going out searching for this pregnant lady who was left on the side of the road, I believe when it was cold and snowing? I don't think anyone did. Big Jeff, do you have a comment? No, I was going to concur with you. No one. Yeah. And have a look at some of these images that we see here um, for people looking for Teresa Horbach. Um, there was a lot of uh, investigators there were a lot of private citizens who were combing the area uh, for Teresa Hallbach. And of course, have a look at slide 144. You've got Mike Hallbach and Ryan Hilligus, two peas in a pod, looking for uh, Mike's sister, which is remarkable. And it's scary, potentially very scary, that. Ryan Hilligus may have had a hand in her either murder or disappearance. And there we have her brother and her ex-boyfriend together. And that, to me, is just a massive conflict. The last thing you want to do is to have an ex-boyfriend involved in a search party. Big Jeff, do you have a comment? I find it very interesting that for the... Calumet calls, um, which uh, we had much earlier, that the Calumet dispatchers are very careful <clears throat> to say that law enforcement does not have anything to do with these searches. These are being handled by the family. Yes. Um, and and I, I think there's some very, um, you know, so probably some uh, subtle uh, laws that I for sure don't understand with regard to if these yes. uh, people become agents of the police, then they are bound to the same a need for search warrants as police. Yes. Um, uh, um, uh, but if you listen to the recently um, released Manitowoc um, search warrant, uh, sorry, dispatch calls that Millbilly's put up, then you hear the Manitowoc police saying, oh, we're yes. in charge of this search and this group of searchers. And I find yeah. that very interesting. Yes. But um, well, you, yes. you, you also hear, you hear Pagel. Uh, say himself, oh, it's Manitowoc's case. We're uh, providing assistance for them because they ask if they should bring their mobile command unit out there, and they said, no, Manitowoc's already got theirs out there. Yes, yes. And this uh, is look, well after they found the car. Yes. But according, according to Queso, when Greg Shetter 
informs Pago that the lawsuit between Manitowoc and Stephen Avery is going on, and it'd be a conflict of interest. So then he, in turn, puts Wiegert and Fassbender, the two lead investigators, on the case. Yes. Yep. If we have a big Jeff, do you have a comment? I'm just concurring with Millbury Billy that there's just lies everywhere you look. There is, and furthermore, guys, we know because we, we we've seen the material, we've read the testimonies. There are conflicts of interest going on everywhere, and months after the fact as well. And no one seemed to care care a damn. Now, the point I want to make about slide 144 was if you have a look at Ken Kratz, he did exactly the same thing he did with Fassbender. He told, I think it was Ryan, oh, because he wanted to know, why did you direct searches at the salvage yard? And again, Ryan Hilligus gave that smirk of contention as if to say, well, you know, we heard on the media that Teresa, that was the last place that she visited. And he, Ken Kratz, even had the goal to say, oh, so being a non-law enforcement officer, you had the foresight to search at a place where she was last seen. And Ken Kratz gave that same smirk of approval, which is truly remarkable. I mean, you think about it, Teresa Horbach could have been anywhere. She could have even been heading off to Canada or any other place, right? And so it's remarkable that their focus was the Avery Salvage Yard from very, very early on. Correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Ryan Hilligus actually go on the Salvage Yard as well? Who's got a comment? Big Jeff. He does indeed sign into the uh, the Salvage Yard. <laughs> and it's very interesting how he makes the comment during the news interview that the, um, <clears throat> the, that the cell phone coverage at the Avery Salvage Yard is terrible when he supposedly has not been on it yet. Yes. Um, <laughs> but what, one, <laughs> another thing I, I, I did want to bring up, though, there's, there's a prevalent yes, guilt theory that, that's, that's worth considering. Um, and that guilt theory says that, um, of, of course, the guilt theory says that Stephen Avery is guilty, right? Um, yes. But uh, Ryan Hilligus's behavior was that he snuck onto the Avery Salvage Yard the night that he yes. has all those dropped calls, and he sees the Rav Four oh, on yes. the Avery Salvage Yard. That's how he got him. That's how he got the day planner because he had Teresa's extra key, and he's bleeping the yes. car with his key and gets into the car, and that's how he ends up with the day planner. Uh, but of course, if he did that in concert with law enforcement, he did that without asking the Avery permission. All that would be inadmissible and in and of itself a crime. Um, uh, an, an illegal oh, yeah. search, which would get everything else subsequently thrown out, which is why they yes. had to hide it. Um, well, yes. that's an interesting theory that the that the, uh, the 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 guilters make. So be prepared to have a an attempt to dispute it when you um, uh, yeah, yes when, when you're when you're proposed by. Of course, um, Mill Billy, do you have a comment? In that interview, <clears throat> they ask him, "Have you been on the property before this?" And <laughs> yes, they yeah, ask well, they ask him the same question in trial. Yes, and he and he doesn't say what he says in an interview. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, it they look like the uh, cat that drank the milk and and uh, still had milk on their lips because remember when they were, <laughs> remember when they were interviewed um, together, and both um, Mike and um, Ryan were looking at each other very very nervously, and being very cautious. With what they were saying uh, it, at the, at the a news reporter about being on the property, and it's pretty obvious that when you think about it, um, there are news report shots that show extensive maps of the salvage yard. Th these guys had obviously thought ahead and planned everything. Abibi, do you have a comment? Um, just just the fact that that interview with um, Mike and uh, Ryan, that somebody yes. on YouTube, I don't know who, put together a very cute thing with the kids' faces who are colored and uh, how yes. lying and shady they're acting and how yes. they're throwing the other one under the bus. 
and they compare oh, yeah. it to this, and it's cut up back and forth between the two, and yeah. it's identical. Yes, and and the other thing, of course, is that they each finished each other's sentence. <laughs> so, so whatever they were said, they came up with a consensus, right? So it's very, very interesting. Big Jeff, do you have a comment? And in, in their wisdom of the uh, on the fifth, they only decided to give one person a camera. Oh yeah, yeah. In actual fact, guys, we can now go into slide one forty five. Now I'm pretty well conscious of the time so um we've got a few slides to go but this to me was a uh, kaboom do you have a comment so this actually segues into the 145 yes so one of the things that i found telling in that little bobbing session between the two goofballs is yes. when mike starts talking about well it was actually one of the searchers who found the cars he seems to distance himself from the fact that it was his own cousin. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Look, the, to me, this blows my mind. If we have a look at slide 145, we're nearly finished the podcast for today, guys. This is remarkable. Now, let's think about this. We have an ex-boyfriend of Teresa. We have a roommate of Teresa. We just happen to have a searcher by the name of Pam Sturm uh, and her daughter, Nicole Sturm. Well, Pam Sturm just happens to be a cousin of the Horbach family. So you've got three people related to Teresa Horbach in some way or closely associated with Teresa in some way. Pam Sturm happens to be a private investigator. Pam Stern just happened to show up, uh, I believe, about an hour late after all the other searches. And Pam Stern, Milbilly, do you have a comment? Uh, <clears throat> I believe she calls at 6.30 in the morning on the 5th. Yes. The Kelly McCarty Dispatch saying she's just seen in the news that they've been doing searchings again throughout the day. And wants to yes. know where they might be searching. Dispatcher tells her, well, I have no where that'd be. You'd have to contact the family. Yes. And four hours later, she finds the car. Uh, correct, correct, correct. So you've got this remarkable situation. Where, uh, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? Do you know who else? <clears throat> uh, Pam Sturm's cousin. She has another cousin. Do you know who that might be? Uh, let me guess. Is she related? No, no, no. Tell, tell me, Big Jeff. Tell Jerry me. Pagel. A Jerry Pagel. Pagel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, see, what, what we have is something very um, in-house and incestuous <laughs> in a way. Because, because what, like I said, what you've got is you've got an ex-boyfriend, a roommate, a cousin, and Look what look what Pam Stern is given exclusively: a map, a mobile phone, a direct number to Sheriff Pagel. Right. So, uh, Bibi, do you have a comment? Well, one little thing first: she she should have already know Pagel's number since he was her cousin. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and um, also that kind of. Since she's related to law enforcement, you would think that would kind of make the car fall under being found by a law enforcement agent and make yeah. it be part of the uh, the tree of uh, what is that where you can't use it? Um, the fruit of the poison. The poison tree. fruit. Yeah. yeah. The poison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Poison it's fruit. It's inadmissible. Yeah. Yes. Because yes. that does kind of make her. She's related to an agent of the state. Uh, you know? Correct. 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 Uh, Milbilly, do you have a comment? Uh, yes. Uh, you also can't overlook the fact that her cousin, David Beach, was on the Avery property prior to this, two days yes. prior. Yes. That's her cousin, too? Oh, my God. Yes. yes. And he also, in turn, went to other salvage yards and shops in the area, too. But he talks yes. to Stephen Avery. That's correct. And he tells him the same thing. Yes, she came. Between two two thirty, took some photos and left. 
and left. Correct. Correct. Well, um, kaboom. I just have a question. I heard a rumor that uh, Pam Sturm is actually used to be an FBI agent. Is this true? Does anyone know? Uh, no, uh, that I don't know. I know she was a PI. She had about nine or ten years' experience being a private investigator. Bibi. Uh, Scott was uh, had an application in to join the yes, he did. FBI. Yes. Um, uh, so, that would be a matter of public record uh, unless she was an undercover agent. So you should be able to Google her this, the same way you can uh, Google um, Kathy Williford and see that she was – you just find her FBI credentials. So it's hard yes. to hide that. <clears throat> she would have to be pretty deep undercover. Yeah. So basically what I'm trying to get at here is that the little – investigative team uh, involving uh, Mike, Ryan, Scott, Pam, Nicole. It can't be random. It cannot be random, right? So here's the deal. Uh, law enforcement could not just simply walk onto the Avery Salvage Yard. They needed a search warrant. They needed something to allow them to get onto that property. So. Uh, as as has been pointed out in our uh, uh, comments of our panel and also on uh, YouTube, she was also given a camera, all right? So she was given all the appropriate material uh, as if she suddenly finds something. Well, both her and Nicole go to the salvage yard. And the important thing to realise is that, look, the whole family bar... Uh, Earl had gone to Crivets. So they had no issue. Stephen, Brendan had no issue. They had no problems leaving the salvage yard behind. And Earl was there looking after the salvage yard. So there were clearly people at the salvage yard, you know, wanting to buy parts, etc., etc. It was just a normal working day. Now, the family always went to Crivets. So there was nothing nefarious about that. That's what they did together as a family. They had some cabins. Well, Nicole and um, her mum, Pam, Pam Sturm, we call her affectionately Pam of God, they went to the salvage yard. They spoke to Earl. Earl gave them permission to search the salvage yard. But in the pre-trial, we discovered that they were not the only searchers who had gone through. Earl apparently let other searchers come into the salvage yard, looking obviously for Teresa or her vehicle. And that was a comment made by Earl. Pam said that during the pre-trial. Millbilly, do you have a comment? Yes, and, and on the 4th, he let uh, friends Peach, of Teresa's... Friend, friends of no, Teresa's. No, 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 the, the, he let a few people in and one of the p parties he let in he let them drive through the yard drive okay that's the cousin isn't it no that there's that's the thing there's multiple people it's just not david beach some other people were there too it's, yes it, uh, earl states in himself he let multiple people in the yard yes but nobody and else found the rap because they no. couldn't see it nope. there no uh kaboom uh, that that happened on the fifth, not the fourth. That's the thing. There's, like I said, multiple days. You let multiple people in. I've right. heard nothing about letting anyone in on the fourth. Only the fifth, and mm -hmm. I'm not even sure how true that is, because in Pam Stern's testimony, yes, uh, Earl seemed a bit hesitant. To yes. let her in, stating that yes. he had other people come in and they found yes. nothing, a and yes. then he kind of had to back off that. Uh, yes, yes, that's correct. To not create suspicion. <laughs> yes, because uh, Pam Sturm said, "Well, um, Earl said that. Well, other searches have come in, so he was almost hesitant to allow them both in, but he did. He did. Um, so both Pam and Nicole." Uh, came into the salvage yard, and I think within about 15 to 20 minutes, they discovered the RAV. Now, remember, on the 4th, there was a flyover, 
right? And Pagel was in the plane. Uh, I think it was Baldwin as well, and the pilot. And they flew over all around that area, including the salvage yard, multiple times. No RAV4 was seen from the air on the 4th. Now, remember, the RAV4 uh, uh, went... Also... Mill Billy. You don't see the southeastern property on the flyover on the 4th. They were in the air over the areas for 25 minutes, and we got, like, less than four minutes of video. Correct. Correct. For that day. Correct. Yeah, there's no doubt that the uh, video itself was heavily, heavily edited. Now, I know I'm being a bit nefarious and a bit cheeky here. Sammy, do you have a question? Yeah, Rhonda South is asking a question. She said, a thought I've had for years. Why did she need a camera? Her daughter had a cell phone, and I believe it was states that Nicole took pictures of the RAV on her phone. Correct. That I have a correct. possible answer. I believe the camera was given because it had the pictures of the car on the phone to help her find it. Yes. Yeah. That's correct. That's a really good question. Normally you would ask, oh, do you have a camera? As in, do you have a phone with a camera on it? Uh, it's very unusual because uh, Ryan Hillegas was asked, well, did you give a camera to anybody else? And the answer was, of course, no. So Pam received a digital camera exclusively. Mill Billy, do you have a comment? Just the fact that how fast she found the car. It's like she was told to draw, just walk down the driveway, follow the lane, they'll take you right to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or the line uh, on the map. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the way, if I could just comment, the way I see it is like this. Um, I don't know about you guys, but in Australia, we have very large supermarket complexes with multiple lines, multiple shelves. Could you imagine somebody going in blind into a big shopping complex and someone tells you, I want you to find this item. And you walk into this complex with many, many aisles, thousands of products. Within 10 minutes, you walk directly to it and you find it. That's how ridiculous this is when one thinks about it. It's obvious that um, Pam and Nicole have never been to the salvage yard. It's, I believe, 40 acres uh, in size. It's huge. And there were over 3,000 vehicles to it. And according to Pam, this was not a fluke. It was the Holy Spirit that led her to the Toyota RAV4. <laughs> um, uh, Bibi, would you, would you like to make a comment? Yeah, if, if she's an investigator, wouldn't she already have her own camera and even maybe a movie yes. camera because they get slip and fall cases, they get husbands cheating on wife cases, yes. uh, all sorts of things where they would need the ability to capture proof yes. to why she need a camera. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. She didn't need a camera, but there had to be a strategic reason for why um, she was given a camera. Well, the amazing thing is this. She found the car within about 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, according to her, God showed her the way. That's fine. The Holy Spirit showed her the way. But what is remarkable is that once the vehicle was found, um, her daughter, uh, Nicole, took, I believe, six pictures, uh, six photographs of the RAV4. Uh, and you can clearly see the back of the RAV. And it's got a big Toyota uh, sign on it. And I find it rather remarkable, and it says RAV4. And I find it rather remarkable that no Toyota RAV4 was seen from the air. Uh, and what better way to survey a salvage yard one day before it's found and decide yep that's a good spot where to put it so if there are nefarious means whereby the Toyota RAV4 got placed on the Avery salvage yard 
one way to find a good spot is from the air. Guys, would you agree with that? He's got a comment. Big uh, Jeff. But with, with the number of uh, of uh, sightings they have on the on the uh, fifth, yes, it's it's it seems almost impossible that they weren't able to locate it on the third. It just does. Yeah, excuse me, the fourth, the fourth, excuse me, on the fourth, on the fourth. Yeah, um, Billy. What about all these sightings of this car by the Twin River Dam? Yes. Yes, correct, correct. And also, don't forget, Colburn calling in the plates as well on the 3rd. There were multiple people who were who, who cited um, a green, a, Millbilly was a green in this particular case? Yes. Yeah, a, a green RAV4 or a green vehicle. So, yes. It was being cited, but according to the pilot, because they talked to the pilot uh, during the trial, the pilot said, well, if they saw something, they didn't tell me anything. So that's very interesting that I think it well, was Pagel and uh, Hawkins in the plane. I could see that being possible because airplanes are kind of noisy. and Yes. It depends if they were wearing headphones too. That is true. Uh, Bibi, do you have a comment? Well, they might have not seen it because they were looking for a green one in the flyover. Yeah. And, yeah, after oh, all, the yes. one on the salvage yard was more blue than green. Yes, yes. And guys, I think what we'll do, because I'm, I am conscious of the time, and we'll, we'll stop it here. We'll do one more slide. But this is remarkable because Pam phoned Pagel. And you could tell in her voice that she was actually um, taken aback because when she spoke with um, Pagel, she said, oh, but it was kind of bluish green. Clearly on the missing posters, it had said dark green. So her concern was, uh-oh, have we found the right vehicle? Millbilly, do you have a comment? Yeah, she actually tries to call Pagel directly, and yes, she then calls dispatch, and Pagel and them happen to be there. Oh yes, <laughs> look, guys, I think we've been through this enough. It was basically the cavalry being ready. They needed someone to go on the salvage site, find something of Teresa's, call it in get the search warrants and come in on mass and that's i believe the role of pam and nicole sturm they were there to give the aok -okay to bring in the troops big jeff do you have a comment uh, as evidence of mustering the troops we have the am phone call between uh Uyghur and remaker where the boss has a change of plans yes. for us so we're going to go re-interview avery and re-interview zipper yes of course avery is yes. not even there but uh, isn't that a sign that the troops are being marshaled in the vicinity of every salvager? Oh, yeah. And why, uh, do, Mil Mil Billy. why do they go interview everybody by themselves, but when they go to interview a zipper, they all wait for everybody to get there before they do it? Yes. Yeah, there's, look, there's no doubt, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but they had foreknowledge. They knew that that Toyota RAV4 was there, uh, and they were primed. They were ready to ready to rock and roll. All they needed was for Pam to phone in Millbilly. Well, you, you look in who in the department was contacted first. You got Colburn getting yes. contacted from Uyghur. Then Colburn calls Link. Link in turn requests Jacobs and Remaker to contact him and meet him at the station. Yeah. Yeah. Right the morning of the 5th, Jacobs, you can hear it in dispatch call and you can hear it in the radio transmissions. Yes. Do we have Stephen Avery in custody? In custody. Yes, that is correct. Uh, yeah, there's no doubt. And lo like I said, oh, Big Jeff, do you have a comment? Yeah, how many pages of the CASA were written by uh, Jacobs? Oh, that I'm not sure. I know zero, I know. zero, 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 zero reports followed it, by by Jacobs. 
Yeah, Zero. I know Cole. I know Colborn only wrote a couple of sentences, and that was months later. All right, so guys, what I like to do is I like to leave it on slide 146. And uh, what um, Nic I believe it was Nicole, they did six photographs of the Toyota RAV4. And it's pretty obvious by looking at the pictures that the vehicle itself appears to be blue. It doesn't appear to be dark green. And the other important thing is this, a uh, couple of comments. The vehicle was poorly disguised. It had uh, some debris around it. It also had uh, tree branches um, placed on the vehicle. And the comment was by one of the investigators that the trees still had their roots attached. And that's remarkable because uh, Earl admitted that he used an end loader to uh, take trees out, right? Because he was going to plant them. And lo and behold, we have some, what appears to be some of these trees with their roots still attached uh, around the vehicle, which is rather remarkable. So we have the vehicle being blue, not dark green. Uh, we have debris around the Toyota RAV4. And apparently there was a box, a taped box on top of the bonnet of the vehicle but here's the incredible thing you can see that it was daylight clear daylight and if you have a look at some of the pictures the front windows of the toyota rav4 are clear which means that as a private investigator if you're looking for now let me quote foul play something nefarious going on you're going to look for signs of a struggle signs of blood, signs of violence. No one, Nicole, Pam, um, Tom Fassbender, Remica. And a, few of the, Remica, a few of the investigators who were there on site looking at the Toyota RAV4, no one, no one mentioned any blood. Yet, they did mention seeing objects inside the Toyota RAV4, including, I think it was a piece of paper with Teresa's name on it. Kaboom. There was a there was a scan disc that officer said he's seen through the window. Yeah, yeah. yeah. kaboom. Is that you? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So somebody got real excited over that. So, someone did. So the what the point I'm trying to make is this. Um, when they uh, were interrogating both Pam and Nicole um, and they were asked, did you see blood? They gave every excuse under the sun. They said it was dark. It was, you know, overcast. We couldn't see. We couldn't make out any detail. And yet, quite clearly, you can see through the photographs, their own photographs, that it was clear. Kaboom, do you have a comment? So I just want to talk about, there was another item in the car that Pam says that she saw, yes. that being a soda can, where she says she saw it on the passenger side on the floor. We now see it in the Central cup holder yeah, yeah. with a napkin around it. And one of the things that caught my eye in the, the phone call was when she says, it's more of a bluish green, though. That's why we don't want to put, you yeah, know, and she catches yeah. herself. <laughs> yeah. Yes. My thinking is someone picked up that can because that can yes. had Teresa's DNA well, on it. Well, that, that comes and back to that. Yes. Uh, if, you you. Read, if, if you read Queso, if you believe what you hear, what you read, yes. they state that they take seven items from Teresa's house. But they, uh, on, they only list four of the items. Yes. It clearly states in the case report, we were at the Hallback residence, we retrieved seven items, they only list four of them. And if you look at the case of the ledgers with the order that stuff was entered, it goes the items they took from Teresa's house, and the very yes. next two items are the phone calls between Jody and Stephen. Yeah. Yes. Yep. But look, the 
again, guys, we can talk for hours on the RAV. But here's the important thing. A, it was clear. The sun was out. The windows at the front were uh, clear. You can clearly see the console. Under no circumstances did anyone mention seeing any blood. And that's, you know, if you're looking for a sign a sign of a struggle, that's what you look yep. for, blood. And, the, and you got Mike Hallbach saying yes. that they found her car, but there's no signs of foul play. She's, <laughs> yes. still, she's still just a missing person. Correct. Correct. All right, guys. Well, look, again, we've gone well over two hours. Uh, and uh, I think we should leave it there because the next slide is when the action really starts to heat up. But guys, I'd like to thank my uh, fe fellow panelists. I'd like to thank all the listeners for their fantastic questions, and we'll go over those. Are there any final uh, quick comments that from the panel? Well, uh, I, I have, really? as far as these photos that Pam took. Yes. Why is there a hole in the door? <laughs> and then, why do we have photos of it where it's gone? Yeah, you heard him that. say we. Were, you heard him say we were wrapping up, right? That we weren't. <laughs> yes. That we weren't yes. Gonna start this. Yes. Forward so. to a thirsty for Thursday. Yeah. Yeah, that, no, that, 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 that that's a thirsty for Thursday for sure. And um, yeah, that's a brilliant, brilliant question. Uh, Bibi, do you have a quick final comment? Yeah, I'd just like to invite everybody who is still listening to come over to Discord and chat with us in uh, voice chat there. Yes. Um, come and be active there. Yeah. Help us. We're always yeah. looking for help. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of research going on there. And Melbourne also has a Discord uh channel as well um, yes well i just want to add one more thing to that when i pointed that out everybody was jumping on why the hole's there my question is why is the hole gone <laughs> who, who cares who cares who cares how the hole got there why it's there why is it's, it gone it's de yeah it's definitely gone but that that's another podcast right there mill billy and that i mean yeah, I don't want to open up any lines of inquiry because that is brilliant, a brilliant pickup. A big Jeff, do you have a final quick comment? The same comment I make every week is that people who don't have anything to hide don't continue to try and hide things. Yes, uh, and it's pretty obvious that um, Kathleen Zona would love to get her hands on that Toyota RAV4, and it may even be able to answer Bill Billy's question. All right, guys. Uh, I want to thank uh, the panel. I especially want to thank Kaboom for um, his excellent comments throughout the podcast and for his continual hard work um, getting those photographs that we've all seen and enjoyed. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our listeners. Uh, we've now got over 447 subscribers, which is fantastic. And as I said to you before, our, our videos collectively have had over 45,000 views. And I'd like to echo what the others have said. Please come and have a look at Mill Billy's uh, channel, YouTube channel. He's done some really excellent work, uh, especially on the photographs and also on the phone calls. Uh, on behalf of my panel, I'd like to thank everyone. Thank you for your continued support. And guys, We'll see you all next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Enjoy your weekend. Bye-bye. Bye now. Have a me. Take care. Later. <laughs>